Inclusion is the gateway to independence if you've listened to this podcast for any length of time. You know that's one of my favorite quotations. However, when it comes to African American women in the workplace, the divide is still wide and the double standard is still there. A survey conducted by the Gallup Center for Black Voices between November 6 and December 1st of 2020 revealed black women are less likely to believe that they're treated with respect in the workplace. They are also less likely to believe that they are a valued member of their team and that their co-workers have a mutual level of respect for them. One woman who's on a mission to change that is Dr. Maricel Capellan. She's an Afro-Latina, former university faculty, and she has a passion for women in leadership, black women in the workforce, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and self-improvement. She's the founder and director of Transformational Coaching Certification at the Kaplan Institute. As an Afro-Latina mother and immigrant, she has faced many of the institutional and systematic barriers and biases that black women face when they attempt to enter the workforce. She joined me this week to have a conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion for African American women and Latinas in the workplace and how we can create more diversity of opportunity for all. I'm Kevin McShan. Let's have this conversation. you to the program and I'm super excited to dive into your passion of women in leadership, the workplace and uh, African American and Latino, uh, Latino women in general. Great uh, to see you this morning and thank you so very much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. This is a great space. Absolutely. Now, uh, Doctor, I want to dive directly into your passion to women in leadership women in the workplace and equality for a black and Latino women. Tell me about the work you do and why it's so uh, important and passionate for you. Yeah, so I do um, I do workshops and I do speeches and I write about the importance of inclusion. Um, and my focus is usually on women and black women and Latina women in the workplace, black Latina women. And I think it's very important that we keep talking about inclusion because I feel like in the DE and I space, we look at inclusion only as it pertains to maybe ethnicity or gender or being or, or race. But people sometimes have an intersection of multiple identities. You may have somebody who's black, but is also Hispanic and maybe also disabled. And all of those things have to be taken into account when we're talking about inclusion. It's not only a one size fits all. And I have an intersection of identities. I am now Latina and I'm black. So I do, I, I, my race is black and I'm also I have an accent, I'm an immigrant, and those are things, you know, when you're talking about businesses and society and being inclusive, you have to take into account all of these multiple inter all of these multiple identities because all of that will 
shape sometimes the path of an individual. Um, sometimes, you know, it's it different for some individuals than others, uh, but it's not a one size fits all. That DNI or diversity, equity, and inclusion cannot be a one size approach. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Dr., when we look at uh, women with uh, disabilities and, and black women in general and Latino women, what do you think is the biggest area of improvement when we look at women with uh, disabilities in the workplace? What do you want to see improve for that segment of our population as well? So when we're talking about disability, I, I do not do research on disability, but I will tell you this. I haven't seen a woman with a disability, at least a black woman, in a wheelchair or with any like apparent a disability. Of course, there are disabilities that are invisible. I cannot say that all disabilities, you can see it. But I haven't seen any woman with disability in a leadership position. In my role or as I have been in the workplace i've been you know I, i've been looking inside workplaces and saying okay all of the women that are in leadership positions are usually able bodies um they're usually white not black so i think that you know we haven't reached parity when it comes to gender parity with men but also as black women in in minorities is even we haven't even reached parity with white women in leadership positions yeah, absolutely. And Doctor, tell me about uh, the the uh, you're the founding director of transformational coaching of of transformational coaching uh, certifications at your own institute. So tell me about the work you do there and why it's so impactful. Yes. So in the Capitan Institute, we provide coaching certifications for people who want to transform lives and become coaches. And we also do partnerships with organizations that provide leadership training. I am a leadership trainer. I do speaking engagements. And we do have different types of training. We have DNI, we have emotional intelligence, preparing leaders, all of those things we do for our school, our institute. But we also partner with organizations outside of our school to go in and train managers and leaders who want to become better at with their soft skills and also become more inclusive. Absolutely. And, and doctor, tell me, when you look at defining effective leadership when it comes to implementing diversity, what do you think of? I think that the, the thing, the, the most important part of being an inclusive leader, one of the most important things of being an inclusive leader, I'll say there's two. So the first one is caring about the people that you lead. You can be an inclusive leader if you do not care, you genuinely care about the people that follow you or the people that um, you are leading, the people that rely on you, the people that are counting on you. And then on top of that, you need to take action. You know, sometimes the DNI work or, or being inclusive, uh, people talk a lot. There is a lot of performative activism or performative allyship. This is when we say that we care about diversity, equity, and inclusion. We say that we care about gender parity. We say that we care about including women, including people from different backgrounds. But what are you doing? What actions are you taking? Are you paying them? Uh, enough? Are you paying them? Uh, are you compensating them fa fairly? Are you giving those people promotions? Are you giving them power? So I think this is very important. When you're a leader, you need to care about the people that you lead, and you also need to take action on the things that you say that you care. Yeah, absolutely. And Dr. Tell me uh, about your uh, uh, position or opinion on pay equality for women in the workplace. What do you think would make the most progress and what do you think we need to do? So I think one of the biggest progress we've made is that women are now speaking publicly about the challenges they face in the workplace. Uh, there's been some um, movement to create salary transparency and that has been led by different type of employees. So I think that people are now more aware about the real things that happen inside the workplace and inside academia 
before I think that we were more conditioned about going to work and then not making any waves and making sure that you do what you need to do, even if you were discriminated against, even if you were facing a microaggression, even if you were facing biases, you kind of received a badge of honor if you were able to tolerate all of that and then still succeed. I think now people are more aware of what is mistreatment, what creates racial trauma, what is really affecting your well-being. There is a new generation of Gen Zs that are very into their well-being and making sure that they're standing up for themselves and they're not in a very toxic situation. So because we have that awareness, there we are able to put that awareness out there in the public. People are realizing, well, this is wrong. This is not working. This is affecting minorities. And I feel like the progress that we have made is that people that are in, no, sometimes not even in the workplace are seeing what's happening and how sometimes women are treated or minorities are treated in these environments. And, and what do you think the key is to continuing sort of connecting the dots when it comes to equitable treatment for women in the workplace? So when he's connecting the dot, I feel like one of the biggest things we have to do when we're trying to be inclusive with women in the workplace is that we have to allow them to have a seat in the table women should be able to get to these positions or be in positions where they can talk about their experiences. They can talk about what is needed in the workplace. For example, how are you going to create a equitable parental leave if you don't have parents sitting at the table telling the organization what is it that they need? What will make them work effectively? What will allow them to have work-life balance or work-life integration. So you need those people, those voices at the table so that they can implement or impact the change the organization is having to nurture uh, diverse individuals. Yeah, and Doctor, I'm a firm believer of that when you talk about creating an inclusive culture, you have to make it a priority because I think that uh, you, you make time and uh, effort for the things that you prioritize in life. So tell me, how do you think leaders can best uh, make uh, incorporating an inclusive culture on the top of their priorities? So one of the things that they can do is to remove, I know that it's hard for some people to remove biases from the hiring process or from the promotion process for diverse individuals. So one of the things that we can do is try to find frameworks that help us eliminate those biases. So for example, I'm a huge believer that when somebody enters the workplace, they should have a career development plan. So not rely on the leader or on the manager to determine basically um, whether they're going to put you off for promotion or not because the manager may be biased. The manager may be practicing discrimination. And if you're faced with a very bad manager, somebody who's not inclusive, they will block your career trajectory. So I do believe that it's very important that we do have a career development plan that is bulletproof when it comes to biases. So for example, somebody joins the workforce, they should have a picture of what, how long does it take for them to move up the ladder? What are the skills that they need to acquire in order for them to move up the ladder? What are the um, services that they need to do? So there should be clear guidelines about the steps that they need to take so that they can keep track also of their own progress and then they can work towards their own development instead of having somebody who works for a manager and then having the manager decide whenever they feel ready to, to promote that person. So we do live, like we are in the workplace with other humans. We don't know sometimes where those humans are, you know, fond of us or not. Um, so I feel like we should be able to take ownership sometimes of our own careers and the organization should give us a guide plan or the steps that we need to do to, suce to succeed and move up in our career journey. Yeah, absolutely. And Doctor, you mentioned earlier about your own uh, sort of uh, space and your own sort of experience in, in this uh, arena. I know that you're a mother, you're also, as you mentioned, Af uh, African-American and Latino. So tell me 
talking about your personal experience and uh, experiencing biases and how it influences the work that you do today? It's a very good question. Um, I came to the U.S. when I was 16, and very soon after, I became homeless. So I was what they called couch surfing. I didn't have a place to live. I come from a very low socioeconomic class. So I do understand the challenges that people face when they come from poverty, right? So coming from a very low socioeconomic class, I tried to climb up the ladder, I guess, in my life. Because I went and got my bachelor's degree, got my master's degree, got my doctoral degree. And every time, you know, it was very hard, like to be able to go from homeless, couch surfing, to being able to rent a small apartment. So I had to go through every single step. And then to come to a place in my career where I faced biases or discrimination, not based on my work, but based on my um, ethnicity or my race, that was very hurtful because I, you know, you start thinking to yourself, well, I went through so much in my personal life. And then I worked so hard to move up the ladder, to make a name for myself. How come I'm being faced with all of these challenges that had nothing to do with my potential or nothing to do with my credentials? So we tell women, a lot of women, that they need to get their degrees, get rid of the imposter syndrome make sure that they feel that that they do that they read that they get, get they get you know experiences but the truth is that there are a lot of women out there that have the degrees that have their experiences but they're still not represented in leadership positions so it's not because of lack of credentials it's not because of lack of confidence it's not because there is a lack of preparation it's because these biases in these leaders that are entrusted with the power of developing their followers are not taking the responsibility to develop this minority um, staff or employees. And Doctor, I know part of uh, what's keeping you busy these days is you're writing a book entitled Leadership is a Responsibility, Re responsibility where you uh, tackle some of these issues. So tell me about the book and the message that you're Open to deliver through it. Yes. So after going through a very challenging time in my career, I wrote a book. Uh, well, while I was going through that, I decided to write down my experiences and put them on paper. And I wrote a book called Leadership is a Responsibility that basically highlights it is divided into three parts. So the first part is women in leadership, uh, so women experience in the workplace. And in that part, I have, um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. In that in that first part, I have chapters specifically about Black women in the workplace and Afro Latinas in the workplace. And then the second part has my own case study of what I went through in academia, and then the third part has guides for inclusive leadership and career development guides for women. And basically, the book is a compilation of stories experiences, research, interviews that I perform to really identify what are the things that we can do to create inclusive environments and create responsible leaders. And the premise of the book is basically that if we want to make a change in the world, if you want to make a change inside organizations, if you want to make a real change, it all starts at the top. People that are leaders or are the leaders that we have trusted, that we have voted for, the people that are in these leadership positions, they have the responsibility to create an equitable and inclusive environment. If we are lacking in equitable in inequity and we're lacking in inclusion, it's not because it's lacking from the bottom, usually it lacks from the top and the culture comes from top down. So basically it's showing the leaders, this is how much impact you have on your employees' lives. This is how much impact you have on the lives of minorities. And if you don't take the first step to become responsible for their development, for their experience at work, for their a well-being at work, you are contributing to an, a, a, an effect, a, a very negative effect, which is like a negative well-being, collective well-being among your employees and especially among minorities.
Yeah, and Doctor, I'm a, a firm believer that you know talent is often a um, equally distributable commodity, but access to opportunity is not. So I, I, I'm a firm believer that representation matters. So tell me about creating an environment where uh, we can create more opportunities for women to advance in the world. So in order for to create more opportunities for women, you need to, I think organizations and corporations need to invest in leadership development programs. They need to invest in programs that are good for career development. So every field is different, right? You have software engineers and you have marketing and you have uh, sales, like you have different departments in academia. We have a lot of different type of departments in different fields. So it's, it's the responsibility of the leader to identify what are the things or what are the um, trainings that will affect women in the workplace or will affect women that are trying to move to the top. And then making sure that within that career development plan, they include those trainings, that they sign up, that they make sure that the participation of these women are included during their time that they're working in their organization. So every field is different, but I think I am a huge believer that leadership development training works for anyone. And that may increase the access to career development once you're in a position. And another thing related to access, one of the things that I've seen for women in the workplace is that sometimes we are able to access jobs. Uh, but the problem is I've interviewed people that says to me, yes, they, they're able to access it. But if you look at the top, it's still predominantly led uh, or, or is heavily represented by men. So sometimes for us, the problem may not be access for some people. It may be that after you access a job or after you enter a job, you're stuck in one position for many years because you're, you're not given the opportunity to move up the ladder. So we have to give, we have to promote access. And then after you access the job, you, we have to promote advancement. And, and what do you think that you use to promoting advancement in the world? The key to promoting advancement will be to identify the talent that you have. I mean, one of the keys, there are many, many articles out there written about keys. In my opinion, one of the things that we can do is identify the strengths and the weaknesses from everyone in your team, and then work, check what their personalities are, what they enjoy doing, and then making sure that we find a place for them or we find a career development plan for them, an individualized career development plan, because everyone is different. We cannot go with a one size fits all approach. We need to be able to make sure that we know our staff, that we know what they're, what we know what they prefer. We know when they work their best and then take a one-on-one -on -one approach to develop our talent. Yeah, and Doctor, for anyone that is in a woman that, that's in leadership position, that is African, Latino, or African American, that like, well, what sense of respons responsibility or what sense of uh, responsibility is placed on them to continue to uh, provide those opportunities in your city? So we, one of the responsibilities we have as black women and Afro-Latinas women is understanding that we should do a collective effort to increase representation. So some research has shown that women sometimes use what is called the queen bee, have the queen bee effect, which is sometimes we have a minority woman in a leadership position, we have a woman in a leadership position, and then they're the only woman there. And we have to remember that we should uplift, mentor, and sponsor, and advocate for the people that are 
the other women that are trying to move up. So it's not only about us. Whoever makes it, great, you made it. But what are you doing for those that follow you? What are you doing for the rest of minorities? What are you doing to make sure that the representation increases? So that would be, that's what, like one of the responsibility. Of course, all of the leaders should have the responsibility to take care of their employees, regardless of their race, sexual orientation, and everyone else. And I also think that as a Black woman in a leadership position, we should also work to make sure that you know, we are that voice in a room, in a board meeting that reminds everyone else that it's important to not only have us at the table, but to develop upcoming talent and have them also at the table. Yeah, and, and Dr. you talked earlier about developing a career development plan. So I, I'm just curious if we can circle back to that. For me to ask you, what do you think is a of core uh, principles or aspects that should, should be in any career development. Plan. So one of the most important aspects of the career development plan is uh, making sure that the person who is trying to develop their career are having clarity about what is it that they want. And aside from, you know, what the institution offers and what's available to them, it is very important that the person that is working on their career is crystal clear about what are they good for and what is it that they want. And that can be done with assessments, a personality, a test that can be done with coaching. Coaching is very powerful. I believe in coaching 100%. I believe that, you know, sometimes... You need to gain clarity. You need somebody who can ask you questions, who can ask you, how do you see yourself in five years? How can we achieve that? Uh, what can we do personally? Because I feel like it's, it's two work. You have the institutional work and you also have the inside work. In order for you to do that, you have to have clarity about what your goals are within an organization. Uh, Dr. Tell me, uh, what do you think is finally the key bending the arc of progress when it comes to a and I for women in the workplace? So one of the key things that can make um, that can make changes for women in the workplace to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion? Uh, yeah. What, what do you think is the, the key to fundamentally uh, making sure that we're on the path towards uh, progress when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I do believe in transparency. I believe in the movement that is coming up that is called salary transparency. I believe that we should know like how much, like this, one of the, you know, a small step that companies can, can take is to show how much a position is paying. I know it sounds very little, maybe, but it makes a huge difference because one of the one of the things that we're trying to combat as women is eco pay, and if companies get away with not putting the salary range in positions that they post, then they can get away with underpaying women, and then that contributes to uh, you know generational struggles with poverty, generational struggles with confidence, generational struggles that can affect the life of an individual. So I think it's very important that if we're going to do diversity, equity, and inclusion, we need transparency about job posting, about career promotions, about uh, everything that we need to do in order for us to enhance our lives within our careers. So we just need a lot of clear, clear instructions and transparency in our jobs. Yeah, and Doctor, I know that celebrating your culture and, and uh, you're a proud immigrant, as you mentioned earlier. So tell me, uh, I know that celebrating your culture is important to you. So tell me about uh, where you come from and why it's so important to you. So I come from the Dominican Republic. I'm from an island. And it's very important to me because, uh, you know, I love my I love the Dominican Republic. I love America. Um, and I have this deep understanding about the struggles that we go through within our community. And that helps me understand how much work we have to do in diversity, equity, and inclusion. For example, 
People that do DNI that like to lump all the women into women of color. Like if you're not white, then you're a woman of color. And I'm like, no, you know, being a Latino is an ethnicity. Being black is a race. Like this is totally different. And within our own community, we have what is called colorism, which is we may be a, a minority a group. But within the minority group, you have different races and people are treated differently sometimes based on the race. So that gives me an understanding that, you know, you cannot just say, well, because all of you are Latinos, then we you don't need diversity, equity, and inclusion work. You don't have that problem. And it's like, no, within our own communities, within communities, people struggle sometimes to have their voices heard. And being Dominican or being Afro-Latina, being from an immigrant background, not only allows me to have different perspectives of how to advance and how to promote DNI, but I have a personal vested interest in making sure that we live in an equitable and inclusive world. Yeah, and Doctor, I know that you currently live in uh, a South Florida. So tell me about the best part about living in Miami and when you're not, uh, when you're not working, what you enjoy doing for fun. So one of the best thing I love Miami because. I don't like the cold that much. So you, you and me both. <laughs> yes, 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 yeah. So I love the weather. I love Miami and he, and you know, it has a lot of restaurants. You can always be outside. Um my husband wouldn't agree with me. My husband thinks it's too hot. <laughs> but I think I love it. I'm from an island. And I think that's the best thing about living in Miami. And when I'm not working and I'm not posting and I'm not writing my book, I just go out and go to the Go play with my kids and make memories with them. I have yeah. two children. Yeah, absolutely. That's the most important job you'll ever have is the title of mom, right? I agree 100%. Yeah, absolutely. And doctor, tell me my final question for you is, when you think of your own personal and professional legacy, how do you want that to be defined? How do I want that to be defined? Well, that's a deep question. <laughs> that's why I left it for the last one, right? Yes, yes, yes. That's a very, very deep question. Uh, how would I like my life to be defined? I want to be defined, I mean, maybe as someone who tried, who tried her best, who tried her best, and on the way, in her journey of trying her best, still remembered who she was. So staying true to myself while trying to be my best, I think that's a nice thing to consider. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And Doctor, tell me if people want to get connected with you, what's the best way they can do that? So they can go to my LinkedIn profile, which is Marisol Capellan, Dr. Marisol Capellan, or they can follow me on Twitter or Instagram at at Prof. Capellan, like Professor P R O F Capellan. Um, yeah, they can find me there and, you know, always reach out to me. Anybody can reach out to me if they have any questions. They can find the posts that I've made about women in leadership, things that I've written. And I've also do conferences. I've done, sometimes they can find me in conferences. I do lead DNI leadership workshops and gender equity workshops for companies and institutions. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Wright, uh, thoroughly enjoyed our conversation about inclusion in the workplace for Afro-Latino women and African-Americans. Your work in the space and, and time on my behalf is most appreciated, and I want to uh, thank you for engaging in conversation with me this morning. Thank you so much. I had a great time.